Thank you all so much for taking the time to join us tonight. This is our special Advocacy in Action webinar um, where we are really excited to talk to you about the Arizona PWS qualifier, state qualifier um, that our chapter leaders in Arizona have taken on. Um, this is just an incredible feat. Um, as most of you know, PWS is only recognized in 14 states, and we're hoping that by the end of Arizona's legislative session, um, they will be our 15th state, which is extremely exciting. Um, this is a feat that hasn't been, nobody's even tried to achieve this in many years. So we're really excited that our advocates have just gone out there um, and taken it upon themselves to, to take this on. And without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna turn it over to Chrissy, um, who is who has spearheaded this campaign with Tammy Penta and Lisa Lamb um, and Chelsea Locks. And I just, I'm handing it over to you and you should have the availability to share your screen. Um, if you don't, just uh, let me know and we're hey. good. Um, so I'm Chrissy Bergstaller. My daughter, Amalia, she's three, so I'm somewhat new on the scene. I actually don't know a lot of you. Um, and I'm not a politician or anything like that. I am just a normal person that perhaps not unlike you would just do anything for my kid. And this was a problem that I saw and just kind of started chipping away at, thought, hmm, how hard can this be? Let's find out. And uh, <laughs> so we're not done. Uh, we're still, you know, currently, um, it, it's looking good. We still have to go to the floor for a vote, but we've passed some important committees and it's, uh, and it's looking good. So, um, and, and I'm part of, um, I'm on the board for the Arizona chapter of um, PWSA. And I guess we should in introduce the rest of our chapter members. Yep. If you guys want to go ahead and, and take turns introducing yourself, Tammy and Lisa, I'm not sure if Chelsea is, uh, is, is, oh, I see her there too also. So guys, go ahead, take your turns and introduce yourselves. Let's have Chelsea. She's our president. Okay. Hi. Can you guys hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. I can, I cannot figure out my video. I'm really sorry. I apologize for that. So um, again, my name is Chelsea. I'm the president. Uh, I think I've been the president now for almost a year. And my son is eight years old with Prater Willie syndrome. He's in second grade. Um, overall, generally, he's doing fairly well. And right now, I'd have to say that we're getting into like the food seeking behaviors where he's getting up in the middle of the night. If something's unlocked on, um, on accident, then he will get into something, but not too bad. But overall, our family, we're doing really well. And we're from Payson, Arizona. And then we have Lisa, who's been on our board. Lisa. Hello, all. I'm Lisa Lamb. My daughter is McKenna. She is 12. Um, I am our chapter secretary. And I've been involved with um, uh, the organization since the very beginning and um, kind of sprinkle myself throughout the community and um, just try to involve myself as much as I can. And McKenna's doing good. We don't have food seeking uh, behaviors, but we, we don't have food seeking behaviors, but we have extreme behaviors at the moment. So we are really working with some doctors and just school and IEP stuff. And so that takes up a lot of time. So, but I am happy to be here and get this bill passed. And um, my name is Tammy Penta and I have uh, Victor who's 29 and I have been on the Arizona board since 1996, probably longer than some of you've been alive. And um, which is really scary. And um, I've been on the national board now. Um, it's my ninth year. It's, this is my last year on the board and then I rotate off. And um, I, I just wanna give a plug to these ladies. They have been really busting their rumps on this. Chrissy walked into her first meeting last, um, last June and, um, or May, and uh, we somehow persuaded her to get on as a, as a board member. And she immediately just jumped in and got our website up and started doing all these behind the scenes stuff. And then Lisa jumps in and, and helps with, you know, anything such as sponsoring 
family get togethers and, and, you know, working with families in that regard, Chelsea jumps in and does a lot of our advocacy around the state and talking with families. And, um, and I'm just there, I just get a little burned out, but I'm just uh, after that many years, but you know what, I, I thought of something when we said we have 14, I want us to be 15 because 15 is such a significant number yes, to the broader community. I, so. You know what, I'm so, I'm so glad you mentioned that because it's been in the back of my mind and how amazing would it be if, if by May we could say, Hey guys, it's, it's 15 PWS awareness month, 15th chromosome PWS awareness day. And you guys are our 15th state. So that would just be amazing. Fingers crossed. Fingers Thank crossed. You, Finger, yeah. Fingers and toes. Okay. Yeah. So, so with that, I want to turn it over to Chrissy because I know that she's, she's kind of spearheaded this initiative for the state of Arizona. And there's been a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes to kind of get this ready. And I'd like for you to be able to kind of talk about how, how, it came to be that you decided to, to spearhead the initiative and kind of the steps that you took. And I know, um, I think you've put together some, I think you've put together a PowerPoint. So you should have, you should have the ability to share. Um, I've turned that on. So if you want to yeah. go ahead and bring up what you have, you can. Yeah. Um, so I, so to do something like this, I just want to say, you don't need a whole lot of people. We have, this is our, we have this group of four amazing women. These are like my ride or dies. They, cancel things, show up, drive far at a moment's notice. So, I mean, as long as you have, you know, you're, you just need a small crew to pull something like this off. Well, hopefully pull something like this off. Um, and so I'm going to share my screen. I did a little PowerPoint on desktop share. Okay. Um, oh no. Did I not? Um, oh yeah, okay. Yes, that's good. Okay. And all right, it is not working, is it? I don't see it. Okay, let's see here. Share screen, desktop, share. There we go. Okay. Oh, all right. So sorry, I've actually never uh, shared my screen before, but well, I'm pretty sure I can figure it out. Chrissy, to make yourself feel better, I am the worst, <laughs> the worst Zoom chatter, like PowerPoint presenter that ever walked the face of this earth. Well, so. I've also never taken on the state legislature before. <laughs> so, you know, we can figure these things out. Right. Um, so... So yeah, taking on your state legislature, a normal person guide um, by your Arizona chapter. And um, so first up, are you seeing all this stuff too? Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. Everything is I see it. Okay. Hold on one second, Chrissy. Guys, I'm just gonna ask if you are if you don't have yourself on mute, would you would you go ahead and, and try to mute yourself? Yeah. Mute me. Mute me. Okay. <laughs> I can't. All right. Thanks. But I think, okay. I think we can all see this, Chrissy. You're good. Okay, cool. Um, so first up is to just know your problem. Um, so the problem specifically. So in this case, we wanted Prader-Willi syndrome added as a qualifying diagnosis. And I think it's pretty similar, um, you know, state to state. Um, uh, where we have those qualifying diagnoses and then you need the, the three of seven life categories. Um, so this is, so for this is you need to understand specifically how it works, read, find it in the legislative language where in the definition. Um, so for us, it's ARS 36-551 where it just defines developmental disability, find that language and then learn who uses that language. So for us, our state Medicaid, um, they do not use this language. This is something that only DDD uses. Um, do we all call it DDD? Can you can you just let everybody know what DD means? DDD means yeah, in Arizona. Yeah, so it, it's a division of developmental disabilities, and maybe it's called something different state to state. Um, but it's basically the the agency that approves respite hours and does day programming, um, and then of course it's funded by state Medicaid. So they work hand in hand, um, but uh, so this actually, so for us in Arizona, this definition 
does not affect state Medicaid eligibility, which I was unclear on at first. And that was very important to, you know, figure out before I started asking people <laughs> for favors and their help. Um, and then just find real examples in your community. So who, um, who, who's been denied services? Why were they denied services? Even for people that get services, was it, was there an obstacle? Um, like for example, uh, Lisa, do you want to share how, uh, McKenna got services? Do you want to speak to that at all? So like, so Lisa, they get services, but it, it was an obstacle. It's an inequitable obstacle. Lisa, you're on mute. So you may have to unmute yourself. You. Okay. Well, in the beginning, when McKenna was little, we, our services were denied because they were testing her at, a, over her, at her age abilities. And then she was meeting some of those goals. So she got denied. And then we had to go through a uh, redetermination process when she was a baby. And finally we got, you know, everything lined up and set up. And then we um, had another, someone come out and reevaluate her and they did it at an older age where she finally got approved. But at age six in Arizona, you are up for a redetermination um, process. And so we were pretty much denied in Arizona, the qualifying, um, factors are a cognitive delay and an IQ of 70. And so McKenna is, was hitting around 70. So we had to go out and get additional screening and testing and everything done so that hopefully she would hit that 70 and below mark, which she ended up getting. And we got reapproved um, for her services, but it's such a stressful process for everyone to go through because we need all of these services. And to pay out of pocket for those additional testing. I mean, that's, an, that's inequitable. A lot of people don't have the means or the know-how or the energy to do that. So that was really, um, and I started to see this because I sent out a questionnaire when I did the website and on there, it had questions about you know, do you get services? How were you denied? And I started to see that a lot of families had some kind of weird hoop they had to jump through. Um, so, so the first step is just collect I as many of those stories as possible and to just give yourself oh. like a very clear picture of the problem at hand and all the different ways that it manifests itself. And then try to, you know, figure out how that ties back specifically into the legislative language. Um, Chrissy, I wonder, I'd like to ask really quickly because this has come up in our chat. Are we able to, would, would you be all right if um, if we were able to share this this PowerPoint presentation with the participants oh, here today? Absolutely, yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay, so for those of you who are who are curious, we will get that to you if, if at some point tomorrow. Um, so yeah. just go ahead and, and feel, feel comforted. And then I see Charles asked, um, he asked yes. Lisa who completed the IQ testing. We went to see a psychologist. I, um, through our local, um, we have a Facebook page, our Arizona chapter has a Facebook page. And then I reached out to some other families in the area and they kind of gave me some recommendations. And I just found somebody and called and said, Hey, this is what we need. And we're up for redetermination. And can you provide us with all this testing? And she did. And, and depending on depending on the um, the state, um, you know, it could be the school district that does the IQ testing, and DDD will accept that. Um, you know, now I can tell you what I did with Victor was twenty nine, and he was right on that same thing. And we'd already been denied services once, and he had to go in for his his testing, and he did it, and um, he lost services. We did it again. And he was hovering around a 69, but I have to tell you, I have to be honest, back in the day, I'd keep him up all night and put him into meltdown before he went into his testing. And that's what we had to do back then because in Arizona, and that's one thing I think is important is you have to know which things are your qualifiers in your specific state. Because like our population, most of them, unless they have a dual diagnosis of autism, get it because of the cognitive impairment. And if and if they, they don't have that, then they're out of luck. 
And, and so, and the IQ thing, test is not capturing our greatest challenges. Correct, uh, correct. correct. So that's kind of our whole defense. And I, I, and I said that a bunch in all of our testimonies was just like, hey, whether they have a 62 or a 72 IQ, they still have Prader Willi syndrome. And it's, you know, and their challenges are not being taken into account with this metric. Right. So, um, okay, so before you begin, so you found your problem, you want to do this, you know exactly which agency it would affect and how. So there's a little bit of just research that you can do just on your own before you start sounding the alarms, like getting everybody involved, just kind of, you know, just chill and do some things that you can do on your own first. Um, So first, you have to know the population size in your state. Um, So try to contact your um, Department of Health. Um, that was actually surprisingly difficult. I don't know if it was a surprise, but um, they didn't keep data on PWS, but uh, I had to at least have that answer because I was asked it so many times in meetings. And even though I could say, you know, and I could, and I, and, and then even if they say, no, we don't have data, have somebody send you an official email that says, you know, we do not keep data on prader willi syndrome specifically. So that way you at least have that when somebody asks you the question, instead of saying like, oh, I don't know, I haven't checked. Um, and then PWSA, of course, is just our amazing resource. Um, they can tell you how many families they have in their system. And I would, you know, they're so fantastic at outreach. I'd be very surprised if the number was much higher than what they say it is. Um, and then also you just have your scientific literature. So, um, you know, they say um, in, in that literature, it says we have 10 to 20,000 living individuals in the U.S. currently. So, Arizona has 2.2% of the population. So I was like, okay, so 220 people, maybe you can have these roundabout numbers. And that has to be good enough if the actual data isn't there in your state. And I'm going to, I'm going to piggyback off what Chrissy is saying, because that when you're dealing with any rare disease, um, if you have a roundabout number that, that is, that is good enough. Um, that's one of the, yeah. the major issues that we have when we're dealing with any rare disease is that it's really hard to quantify yeah. um, and it changes on a regular basis. So don't, yeah, don't, research. Research. Thank you. Um, you know, as long as, as long as you tried and the number and you know, the number isn't there and this is the best you have, that's good enough. Um, uh, one of the things that, that Chrissy did try to do, though, is and, and, and all and it's a cautionous tale is <clears throat> trying to get our um, Arizona families to give us um, examples while, we, while she was doing the research. Give us, you know, have you been denied? Please let us know what what when what where how. So we had real stories and it was it was like pulling teeth. It was really hard to get that info from some of our families. Participation was was hard. <laughs> I tried not to let it get me down though. I was like, they don't know me. Like, I guess I wouldn't tell me anything either. <laughs> I get that a lot, Chrissy. <laughs> oh, I'm like, whatever. I'm just gonna do this. And hopefully by the end of it, everybody feels really good about it and wishes that they had participated. <laughs> right. um, but, uh, and, and so also if you can get the information of the number, um, so for us, the agency is DDD. Of course, I was told we don't keep uh, data on prader willi syndrome specifically because that's not a diagnosis that we get them in. But then I was able to get a meeting with some like fancier connects and she managed to pull some numbers for us. I was like, oh, I was told this wasn't. So they ca- so if you can, um, so if you can do that, please try. And um, I do want to, I was advised um, to, I was, this was some advice that was given to me, which I thought was really great. So if you do um, manage to get a meeting with the agency that would be affected by this legislation, do not roll in there saying, hey, I'm going to, I'm trying to make a bill that's going to affect this agency. Kind of keep your cards close and instead go in there saying, hey, you know, this is a problem that I'm seeing in my community. Can somebody talk to me about this? And um, so I first kind of asked, is there like an like a, a, a workaround inside the agency that, you know, that can be done to protect our population? Um, because we're, you know, this is, we're seeing some families be denied. Um, and then they basically confirmed for me that if I wanted to see that problem fixed, as I was explaining it, I needed to go to the legislature. So with that, I was just like, well, thank you very much. (laughs) (laughs) 
and you know, so I just I had that confirmation. And then that was something that when I started talking to actual legislators, I could pass on that to say like, yeah, I, I've had a meeting with DDD and, they, and that really kind of piqued their interest. They were like, oh, okay, she's kind of been around and seems to like know her stuff and has, you know, talked to the people. Um, any cost related data you can get, this is so hard to get and likely it doesn't exist, but if it does um, in your state, it would be so amazing to have. And always keeping in mind that what is most expensive to the state is hospitalizations, um, like um, even like behavioral health facility hospitalizations and foster care. Those are like um, uh, politicians, they kind of start freaking out once they hear that, you know, crisis mode equals those expensive things. So if you have data on that, absolutely get it because that can really work in your favor. Another one is um, that Zared Burden interview. Has anybody checked that one out? It's um, basically caregiver burden um, within the PWS population. And um, this wasn't necessarily a study I like printed out and like handed to people, but it was a figure I had in my back pocket when I would, you know, go talking saying, hey, um, care caregiver burden um, in this population is extreme. And so the ZBI, it's um, 17 is considered high. And for the average for families with Prader-Willi syndrome, it's like 44. So it's through the roof. And this is something where like anecdotally, we can say whatever we want to say, but when you have like an actual study like this and you can kind of, they've probably have no idea what a ZBI score is, but if you kind of just, you know, if you have this data, this really helps you. And then, um, and then next is how many states uh, have this legislation and Dorothea, thank you so much. Because you gave me this printout. This was like your hard work. And I was definitely asked this about three times. And one time was actually in a hearing. Yeah. So oh, wow. I was able to whip this out. <laughs> like, yeah, it's not just me. <laughs> you know, other states have done this. Um, so they don't feel, you know, they want to know that other states have done it. And it was critical, very critical um, for us to have that because DES, who is the umbrella for DDD, um, have and they will send somebody because that's their job to counter because let's, you know, whether it's a hundred dollars or, you know, I mean, she told us it would cost anywhere from 300,000 to $12 million or something, Garbage. but she didn't have this information and, um, yeah. We were able, Chrissy was able to go, I have that. And we were able to, the representative, you know, the chairman says representative, you know, if you want to, you know, hear the numbers, you know, you have to invite her back up. So Chrissy was invited back up and she had all of this information and just was a slam dunk at that one because it was so critical. Yeah, and that, that was, that was in the house, right? The house HHS committee. The house hearing and the questions just happen to take us there. Um, likely the questions won't take you there, but this is information when you start going sponsor shopping, as I guess I'm calling it now. Um, <laughs> you want to have these are just these are just some great pieces of information that you need to have before you, you know, um, start asking people for their time. Uh, the next thing, I cannot stress this enough, connect with organizations that can help you. Um, find a, legislator gu a legislature guide is what I'm calling it. And um, I found this amazing woman, her name is Michelle Crow from Children's Action Alliance. And I, basically everything I'm about to tell you is just what she told me. <laughs> and this is, a, you can have somebody who is just like, so smart with policy and understands how a bill is made. But if they don't understand specifically the players in your legislature, you really need that person, somebody who it's, it's their job to interact with these people. They know how they vote. They know who's going to sit on the committee next session. They have this kind of insider knowledge that I definitely did not have. And um, this, you know, this was just kind of lucky. I was just calling around to everybody and got directed to them. And she answered the phone. And I, I told her what I was doing. And at first, you know, she was kind of like, uh, yeah, I just called like, hello, do you know about the, our state legislature by, by chance? And she's like, you know, huh? who's asking? 
<laughs> and then she's like, well, you know, you might want to do this or that. And, and then I did, I did this and that. And then I reconnected with her a couple months later and was just like, Hey, I did all those things you suggested. And now I'm here. Can you help me again? And that's when she really kind of took me under her wing and, um, she's just kind of basically been with me every step of the way, every little question I have. Um, here's my Valentine to her. <laughs> uh, she's, she was incredible. And I, 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 I trust there is an organization in your state that is dedicated to like children's action Alliance. They're dedicated to children and families. And they're basically like watchdogs for policy that affects um, children with disabilities, housing. Um, and I'm so glad they exist. I, I'm kind of like accidentally on their committee now. And uh, <laughs> you're uh, in trouble. Yeah, she accidentally got where we're at. <laughs> you're, in, you're in big trouble, Chrissy. <laughs> <laughs> Should we answer June's question? June had a, a question about recognized on, because different states are different. Some of you states have um, waivers and not um, recognized. So in Arizona, there's five qualifiers, June. Hey, um, Tammy, you have Tammy you're, you're, you're breaking up a little bit. You kind of sound like you're in slow motion. Okay. Can you, Chrissy, let's try. So, stay right yeah, in the so middle. Sure. Stay right in the middle of your computer screen. and It'll probably pick up better. Okay. So this does this does not um, impact state Medicaid in our state. It's DDD that uses this definition to determine eligibility. And in our state, and they do lift it from the federal. So I think a lot of states are pretty similar. But our state says you have to have one of five qualifying diagnoses, and um, Prader-Willi syndrome is not on there. Um, and display an impairment in three to seven categories. So our kids can always, almost always have an impairment in five to six of the categories, but if they don't have a qualifying diagnosis, they're not allowed in the front door for consideration. So this would just ensure, and, and a lot of our kids get in under cognitive disability or if they can manage to get an autism um, co-diagnosis. But so this just ensures that even if their IQ is 72, you know, they can still get in based on the fact that they have Prader-Willi syndrome. Um, so that's, so, so that's basically uh, what but it means. Chrissy, for, for what benefit? That's, that's been my issue because I've wanted this in Texas and to actually define what we're looking for becomes a, pro, you know, becomes an issue because really, you know, for us, for instance, it was Medicaid. We were, we both worked and our insurance didn't cover growth hormone. It didn't cover some of his meds. It cost us a fortune. He got on Medicaid, I think when he was nine and a half or something like that, we paid $1,400 a month cash up yeah. until that. So, you know, would that, is that like what, when you qualify, what do you qualify for? So, what does so this get in you? our state, it's, it's called Division of Developmental Disabilities, and it's the agency that basically goes hand in hand. So it's um, the agency, you get a caseworker, and they are the ones who approve respite hours, HAB hours, um, they have day oh, so that's the same as the waivers here. Okay. Okay, so it's, I guess it's, um, so they use this definition, and then that is funded. If you have DDD and you don't have state Medicaid, it basically is nothing because there's like no funding coming from anywhere. So you really, they really do work hand in hand. And then in our state, it's really just affecting that DDD um, component. So do you get better recognized in school then? Uh, or are the school still under recognized part of Willie no matter what? Hmm. That's a whole mm, okay. different kind of work. Because we fight for this and then, if I, you know, it gets to a point where I, like, okay, what are we actually, what do we hold, you know, that's my thing. Like yeah, we want to be recognized I mean, and we want to get the benefit, but what are we actually asking for? So, that, that's, so that's the important part of like knowing specifically your problem and really just kind mm -hmm. of piecing together everybody's stories and being like, okay, well, wait, why were you denied that, you know, and piecing together um, who is using this definition. So at first I thought our state Medicaid used this definition too. And then but from talking to families, I was just like, well, wait, this isn't right. Cause they get that and not this. And then I, and it's in its different state to state, um, but uh, so yeah, I so for us that's what it means. But uh, I think I thought it was similar for most states, though. And and it is similar for mm -hmm. most states, but it does vary from state to state. So it's right. really it's really important to kind of identify what what it looks like in your state. Um, mm -hmm. And that's yeah, you know, that's my question. So it's a, like, it's a what, hard it's a hard question. What yeah, do you qualify for? What is the benefit of the fight? Um, so like the waiver program, uh, you maybe so you see jump the line, you, you jump the 20 year waiting list. Basically, if you get the recognition. 
Like here, it's a twenty-year waiting list for. We like don't. We years. don't have June. We don't have a waiver here. Right. We don't have a waiver. Okay. So maybe, so, uh, maybe yeah. just really research like um, how how do you qualify for a waiver like specifically, you know, and kind of see like what definitions, what screening process they're using. Yeah. Um, because some government agency in your state is using, you know, the legislative definition. Right, right, yeah. And I mean, we have all that. It's the waiting it list. Is and what it means. Right. And, and June, you know, I know um, this was actually brought up in our work group, our advocacy work group um, at our last meeting. One of our, one of our members brought up, oh, well, hey, listen, this is right. PWS is recognized in the state of Mississippi. And I said, well, no, it's really not. And they, they they showed what they were referring to and actually what they were referring, were referring to was a document which states if you have Medicaid um, and you have Prader-Willi syndrome, then you are automatically qualified to obtain growth hormone. And I said, well, that's a very different thing than being- Oh, that's different, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so really it's, it's just, it's knowing, it's knowing you know, what your state regulations are and, and really what it is that you're looking for. But um, you know, one of the things that I, I, I believe that this could help um, from state to state, we, you know, we're in the process of trying to have um, Prader-Willi syndrome added to social security's list of compassionate allowances. And we've had a group that's been trying to do this for a minute. Um, we do have um, Congressman Tonko who's helping us usher this through the, the social security uh, pipeline, if you will. Um, right now, and he's he started working on that this fall. So we're 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 cautiously optimistic. But um, so something like this, if it if 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 PWS is recognized in your state, and you did need Social Security, and you're not on the list of compassionate allowances, you know perhaps this is a way that makes uh, it easier for you to obtain Social Security benefits if you're. Oh, so that would be one for sure. Yeah, right. So right. it's it's it really it, it really depends on what you're looking for, where what the age of of your loved one PWS is, and and what the state offers. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then I'm hoping it has um, benefits, you know, there's the immediate benefits of eligibility, but then I'm hoping that down the road, it just kind of gets us a more serious seat at the table, you know, for right. conversations mm -hmm. for other things. I mean, that's very speculative on my part, but it's kind of what I'm hoping for. Um, so next step before you start calling anybody. Um, just to familiarize yourself with this, your state legislature, um, this is pretty easy. You can just get on the website, check out the calendar. When does your session begin? When does it end? Uh, when is the deadline to drop a bill? Um, who's in leadership? Who's, um, who's the min minority leader? Who's the majority leader? Who sits on the committees? Um, the committees for a bill of this nature that are going to be um, uh you know, important for you would be health and human services and appropriations. So, uh, so a bill will first go to its policy committee. And in our instance, that would be health. And then um, almost all bills go to appropriations that deals with the money, the budget. And then uh, there, and then there's also the rules committee, which we don't really need to worry about. It's just to kind of make sure that the way it's written, it holds up legally. Um, and then, so track a bill, try to find a bill um, that's sort of similar to what you're doing in the health sphere and just kind of follow it around. See, you know, see what committees it goes to, see who votes for it, who votes against it. And you can actually watch a committee hearing, um, you know, on the website. So just, so get a feel for it. Um, watch a health and human services committee to just kind of, and also this was like great advice that Michelle gave me too, was you just kind of, you, you get clues from the legislators by just watching a committee. You can kind of piece together who they are, what makes them tick, you know, and, and you can just get, there's a lot of valuable information that can be um, gained. Um, and then next is the, um, uh, so the right to speak system. I, I'm sure it's different in every state. Ours in Arizona is not very accessible. Um, you have to actually go to the Capitol to register. And then a right to speak is you have to register if you want to actually testify at the hearing, but also you have to um, register to like thumbs up or thumbs down a bill. Even if you have, you can do this with any bill. Once you're registered, you can get on there and any kind of bill that you think is problematic in your state, you can, you know, thumbs down that use it. I love um, that. Yeah. <laughs> it's I know. I I never even knew it now I have, you know, I'm like, oh, I'm going to I've kind of been um playing it smart though. So I haven't been like doing thumbs down in some bills because uh, they're bills that like our sponsor 
yeah. is like championing, you know, I, so I'm just like, okay, maybe I'll wait until I don't want to like show my hand <laughs> quite yet <laughs> until we get what we want. Uh, and and it, it, this really sounds very complicated and it's not. I did it for Chrissy and I, because we actually had to drive from Tucson to Phoenix to our state capital to get on their computer. Am I still? You're yeah. better. Well, hold on. We'll get to that part, Tammy. Uh, hold on. Okay. This is, um, this is, we're just, just kind of know what's, we're going to do the whole right to speak part once we're in like mm -hmm. go time. But uh, so this is still just kind of behind the scenes. Like I'm thinking about doing this. I'm kind of getting up to speed with how it works. Um, so next is uh, choosing a sponsor. So um, no matter where you stand politically, it doesn't matter. You need to go where the power is. If your legislature is controlled by Republicans, you get a Republican sponsor. You need to ensure that your bill is going to be heard. And at least in Arizona, if a bill is sponsored by the minority party, it's not getting uh, agendized. So, you know, ensure your chance of success, go where the power is. Um, and ideally you want that person to sit on the health committee because um, they, that just puts them in a position to say, hey, my bill next, please. Um, you may need insider info. So ideally you're kind of checking this out right now um, and you're planning to, make your move next session. So you need insider info as to who's definitely getting reelected next year. Are they still going to sit on this committee? Um, uh, just, you know, who do people kind of have their sights on as far as um, who's into this kind of bill? Who's tired of this kind of bill? Um, if, they're, if that person is in your district, it is not at all necessary, but it's definitely a plus. Um, but don't let that, you know, I would definitely just go for the better sponsor before I picked just someone in my district. Um, and you don't have to pick just one. You can talk to a few and just kind of see who seems excited about it. Because even if somebody says, oh, sure, I'll sponsor that, but they're not like really passionate about it and they're sponsoring like so many other bills and maybe they're not going to prioritize yours. So you really kind of just want to feel it out um, who is who who's just like oh yeah that's a good idea like this is this is kind of what I've been looking for you know this uh this makes me look good I'm gonna take this on um so those are just some tips in choosing a sponsor um the best times to approach so I have found that you know it's you kind of you can't just approach whenever you have to pick strategically because by doing that you're showing them that you understand how it works you don't want to just roll in there like with you know uh no idea what you're doing like you want you know you want to present that it's like okay i have an understanding of how this works i'm going to make it worth your while um so some great times to approach are um so this is before session so after the primaries um, that you can kind of get on their radar. They'll have lots of time like at this point. So you can just kind of say, you know, oh, hey, congratulations on the primaries. And I was thinking about this bill for next session. Um, you know, what are just kind of get a get a temperature. Um, and then you can reach out to them again after the general election. Once once their seat is they're like, OK, I'm in. Um, and then you have another window um, be like right before session begins and after committee assignments. And this part, this is really where you need your insider as well, because we as the public don't know committee assignments until basically session has started. So you really need someone who is like, they are just like knee deep in this and they're like piecing together the tweets and they know who's gonna be on the committee because they talked to so-and-so. Um, so you want to try to get ahead of the ball on that um, and just connect with somebody who knows and can kind of tell you who's going to sit on the health um, committee. And then um, and then once session begins, you have like a tiny window um, before the bill intro deadline. And that's also a really busy time. So ideally, you want to have um, uh, a commitment um, that they want to sponsor your bill before a session begins. And ideally, you've been having meetings with them before that kind of just like gearing up to this time. Um, okay, so then meetings, I think just for a meeting, just go in with a very small team, maybe 
like your one point person, you, if you're the one that really wants to take this on. And then um, I found it helpful because my daughter's only three. So I found it helpful to have a more experienced mom um, with me who could kind of speak to, who could kind of give them the like shocking, like hyperphagia story who could really, and it's, it's, it's hard to ask someone to do that. You know, you, you're like, Hey, will you just come tell the ugly part in this meeting with me? Um, and, but you kind of need to give them that honestly for, to get their attention. Um, and I mean, we do have that, you know, this like shock value element of it. Um, have a one pager at the ready of just, um, of what you're trying to do, how this affects your community. Um, and so if you're doing a meeting in person, that's something, I mean, we did this at the DC fly-in, you know, um, you just kind of slip it their way before leaving. Or if you're just doing Zoom meetings, um, it's something that you can just shoot them an email afterwards. And then in all of my meetings, I made, well, when sponsor shopping, and I felt like this really helped. I, I always was very sure to express um, like our preparedness. Um, I would just kind of say like, hey, you know, um, we are completely ready to present ourselves in an infect in an effective and compelling way um should we be given the opportunity basically just telling them like we're going to make you look good you know we're organized we know what we're doing it's going to be like a moving day um at the capitol the day our bill gets heard and i always try to to express that you know without being too like patting myself on the back or something <laughs> and i i i did feel like that kind of you know, that got some of their attention or just like, oh, all right. Hmm. Well, I mean, and Chrissy, to be honest, that's exactly what happened. <laughs> <laughs> it is exactly what happened. Oh man, we made our sponsors look so good. The other, yeah, the other, uh, the other reps were jealous. They were like, damn, oh, like, dang, I wish I, you know, you can afford it. <laughs> This, uh, yeah, we're, we're recording, but it's okay because I'm, I'm usually I'm usually the one using the four letter words, so we're good. <laughs> oh no, hold on. Oh no, how do I go back? There we go. Um. Okay. So, uh, in every meeting, I was very sure to always follow up with an email. Um, I kind of did this just for my own organization too. I would recap all of their questions and concerns and attach any data files that kind of backed up what their questions were so that they just had that. And also to just show them that like, we're organized, we're ready to go. I'm not just willy nilly calling you thinking like, oh, wouldn't this be cool? You know, so I'm, um, all right, so all of that worked and you have a sponsor. This is so exciting. Um, so once you have, um, and this should happen before session where they say like, yeah, I'm interested. I will sponsor that bill. And then at this point, you can reach out to other committee members on the Health and Human Services Committee. And you can go in with this information of, hey, we have sponsor. Yeah, it was Pingarelli in our case. And um, and you want to you want to always approach the you want to get a meeting with the chair of the committee just as a sign of respect. And the chair is going to be the one that agrees to put it on the agenda. So you don't you know, you want to you want the chair to have know that you reached out to them so that when their committee member comes to them, they're just like, oh, yes, I've heard of that one. <laughs> they, they reached out to my office. And so you want to always reach out to the chair. Maybe the chair sponsors your bill. I don't know, but um, uh, reach out to them, and then um, and then someone from the other party as well, um, so that you just kind of have some bipartisan. And you don't have to get a meeting with every single person on the committee, but like we did a few um, for each committee, and I felt like that was a good number. Maybe maybe I would have played it a little safer, and in, in retrospect, like tried to get a couple more before committee, but that seemed to work for us. Um, and then understand that it is a super busy time. You sending just an email is not sufficient. You have to call, you have to get friendly with their aide. You have to know their aide's name. You have to um, say, okay, great. I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna follow up with an email. I'm sending it right now. Um, you really need to, because they are just, I mean, you know, their emails are just like, if you're just sending an email, forget about it. 
Hey, Chrissy, um, you're, you're the, in the, per, the people or the members that you did meet with, can you, what was the, like the average amount of time that you had during those meetings to kind of give your pitch? Uh, 20 minutes. That's yeah. 20, good. 20 to 30 minutes. It was pretty good. Um, one of, them, um, uh, he got on late and was just like, okay, so actually we only have 15 minutes, you know? Um, okay. so, so have, um, so have kind of different versions of, um, uh, of what you're trying to say, like the long version and the short version. Um, and then, uh, so once you, uh, once you have a sponsor, um, keep checking the agenda. Um, they, it's busy and they may not call you when it gets on the agenda. This happened to us. It got put on the agenda and she didn't call us and for like four days later. And once it gets, so, so just keep checking the agenda, go, you know, if your sponsor is from the house, you just go house health and human services and click on the date and they do just one every week and just see what bills are they hearing? Okay. That's not us. You know, what bills are they hearing? Okay. That's not us. Um, and you'll get a feel for when they, um, when they post those too. I'm going uh, to, I'm going to piggyback got a call on Thursday night, Thursday night that it was going that following Tuesday. And it was a call from another friend on looking at something else and seeing ours. That's how, we found out. Oh yeah. It's like go time. Once it's, uh, once you've got a sponsor and session has begun, like watch out and just be on the lookout. Don't expect anyone to call you. I mean, they should, but they, they don't necessarily do that. However, there are a lot of state legislatures where you, if you can go on their website, you can plug in a bill number. Um, they, they, you can, you can opt in to get emails on the tracking of that bill number. So you can get like a notification in your email box. Anytime something happens with that specific bill number, whether it's being brought up in committee or whether it's passed a committee or failed or been a co-sponsor signed on to it. So that's another way that you can, you can help kind of follow the alerts of, of At that bill. At this point though, we didn't even know what our bill number was. <laughs> that's horrible. Oh, you know, it was so like. But that's good. When it moves, it moves. Yeah. Um. Oh, I guess I should have said kind of back there too. Um, someone needs to draft the bill, and the, um, anyone who, um, anyone can draft the bill. You can kind of even send like an example draft, or have national kind of give you an example draft. They love having the work taken away from them. If you, can <laughs> like, oh, it would look yeah. something like this, right? And then, yeah. <laughs> so like, so so we can actually, if 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 so, Jen, I see that you're you're asking that question. You know. Depending on on how the statute is written in your state, um, that's how the bill has to be written around that statute. But you can you can we can give like an outline of what it's looked like in other states. And committee staff is really those are the people that really draft the bills. Um, so we can help make that we can help them make that pretty easy for folks. Yeah, I'm. And in Arizona, I was like shocked to learn that like, oh no, anyone can uh, draft a bill. You can draft the bill. I was like, I can. Um, and then you asked also, um, are we able to get on Medicaid regardless of income? So so yes, it's like the disability division of Medicaid. And for us, it's called Altex, um, Arizona Long-Term Care Services. And um, uh, but they use a different, um, it's called the, pre-admission screening they use like a different criteria um but but yes it is so my daughter has it and it's um independent of income correct not that I make so much money but it is independent of income uh and uh so okay so then keep checking the agenda and then um prepare testimonies you want to um uh, have an idea of who is going to speak and what they're going to say and then here's kind of um, what makes a good testimony? Um, you want to be, you want to tell as effective and complete of a story as possible by being as respectful as possible with time. Like, uh, technically anybody is allowed to get up there and talk, uh, strategically, you probably don't want to be that guy, like have just kind of one person, you know, kind of tackle one subject. Um, and then Tammy, I thought this is a great time for you to pop in because you and Victor really, um, 
Well, Victor was the rock star, you know, so I, I mean, you know, I was a cop along. So the way I kind of looked at this whole thing was, you know, Chrissy was our incident commander. So everything had to go through her, by her, She had because otherwise you miss things or you forget things. And so we, 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 up to this point, everything went through her, including what we were going to speak about. Um, um, so what we did um, was the logical choice of, per, of the person to speak on the logistics of all of this, the numbers and everything was, was Chrissy. And she has a younger daughter. So, you know, she's not into the meat and potatoes of it as some of us older um, parents are. And so she was able to kind of lay a really solid foundation of why we're there in um, three minutes that turned to two minutes at time. You don't have a whole lot of time to speak. They told us, th us three minutes and it was really two minutes that we had. Um, and then we wanted to put something else together on um, with a family, like, and when I spoke, Victor's 29, the average lifespan is 29. And so I just kind of took it at that angle to try to get the heartstrings going instead of celebrating his, you know, 29th birthday, like the rest of us do with our, you know, our, with us or our children, we're, you know, scared out of our wit because we don't know what is to come because of what we have. There is no cure. And we talked about, you know, we've had now three deaths in Arizona in the last two years. So, you know, we put that in and imagine you have to put this in a two minute speech. And then um, the first time we went through, we just then had Victor. And I think it's really important to have somebody with Prader-Willi syndrome to be able to speak. Because let me tell you, um, Christy and I were looking at each other um, when they started applauding in the Senate um, HHS committee and the senators were clapping and we're like, oh my God, I don't think we should clap because this is against decorum. But like he brought down the house, you know, you know, the first two times he went in there and he really honed in on um, his opening statement. He goes, I don't know what it's like not to have product, but I can tell you it sucks. And it, I was, it, was, it was amazing. It was an after school special for everybody that was there. Like they all learned something new. It was, it was amazing. And that's also just such a part of, I mean, any time that you're going to do anything in the disability world, like that's a whole movement is don't talk about, uh, don't talk about us, you know, like it, like have us in the conversation. So anytime you can include somebody, any time you talk about anything with disability, you should always try to, you know, center the voices of those with a disability when possible. And then after we we were in the house, we we kind of got the feeling that they didn't quite understand hyperphagia how that really affects our families. And the, and the person with Prader Willis syndrome. So we actually brought in Becky uh, Bigler Smith, who used to be on our board, because she's had some horrific um, situations this last year. It's been going on for a few years, but this last year specifically, and she was really able to make a very um, um, great um, speech on how difficult it is, and. Mm -hmm. That she doesn't get services for Prader Willie. She only gets them because he has an autism diagnosis. So that helped as well. So, you know, you you find those people, the younger person, the person with Prader Willie syndrome, the older family, or somebody who has really extreme issues that's comfortable and doing a two-minute thing. And and you look at that. I don't know, Chrissy, that we would do any more people than, you know, than four people, including a person with Prader Willi syndrome. We yeah, brought it. And in I, fact, yeah. And in fact, this last one, I bowed out at the appropriation. Yeah, the last point. one, they made it very clear, like, hey, we only want to hear from like two people, you know, um, and that was the appropriations committee, which had a different vibe in, your, in the policy committee, which would be the health and human services. Um, you, you get to tell more of a complete story there. Um, so there's these stories, but also good stories. If you had a medical professional who wanted to speak, um, if you have somebody who has a story about being denied eligibility or, you know, someone who knows family stories, I mean, there's no one right way to do it. Um, but okay. I'm going to, I'm sorry. I'm going to try to go through as fast. I know we're like, 
been going for a while. So it's on the agenda. This is like when it all happens. This is like, oh my God, it moves so fast from here. And this is when you just have to have a team. You have to have a team that is just ready to go on a moment's notice, um, which is really when our chapter leaders, um, Chelsea, Lisa, Tammy, just really just jumped to and prioritized this. And it was amazing. Um, and then in this moment, this is when you enter support. So you can um, gather um, uh, uh, emails from people who want to support your bill and you can enter them in the system. At least you're allowed to in Arizona. So we just gathered all of our friends' emails, went to the Capitol, entered them, thumbs up the bill, and we got on our... Um, so we have like over 200 um, supporters, which is great um, for something like this. And then, so you wanna make sure your um, testimonies are fine tuned. And then this is when you can invite families to join, to show up and support, ask them to wear orange, ask them to come to the committee, make a showing of it, bring the kids. Um, and then and then don't be afraid to ask for accommodations. Uh, we did this and I was so glad we did um, and the, and it was always granted. We just basically asked if our bill could be heard first um, for the people with prader willi syndrome in attendance. And they always said yes. And I think it also just kind of shows, you know, that like, hey, that's what this bill is about is like recognizing disability. And so why don't we start here with you make us a reasonable accommodation, please. <laughs> Um, so here's how a bill moves. I, I won't go so into this, um, but um, it's how bill becomes a law. We're probably familiar with this, but specifically, I want to just point out where you get to participate in this process, which I was unclear about. Um, before going into this, I, I understood how a bill became a law. Okay, got it. But I had no idea at what point I got to do something. Um, so this is where we get to do. So your bill is introduced. Um, once it gets agendized to its committee, this is where you register to speak. This is where you get support. Can you see my mouse? Um, and then, um, and so then the committee hearing comes and you get to testify at that committee hearing. Um, it will usually always go to health committee first and then probably appropriations and you can testify there as well. Um, but you have to redo your register to speak. Um, and then, I, I was told that we don't need to go to the rules committee. Um, so after it hopefully passes that committee hearing, this is where you brought in your base of support. So this is where you reach out to those families. You say, okay, we passed the committee. It's gonna go to a floor vote. So in the committee, for example, we had, uh, I think it's like seven, um, seven reps in the committee, but we have 60 reps on the floor. So you want to, try to contact as many representatives as possible through families that live in their district. Um, living where you live has power. If you have a family that lives in a district, they can call and say, hello, I am your constituent. Um, you know, I, um, I am related to a person with prader willi syndrome in this way. And this bill is very important to me. Basically, without sounding threatening, you want to say, I'm paying attention to how you're voting for this bill and I'm in your district and I will vote for you or not. <laughs> and, and Chrissy, I'm going to, I'm going to add on to what you're saying, because one of the things that we're actually doing right now, um, and the email is going to go out tomorrow from the national level, um, is we are reaching out to our Arizona families who have granted us access to reach out to them on a regular basis. And we are, we have created an action campaign where they can click the link that is going to be provided in the email. And when they click that link, they will have an opportunity to see a letter that is pre-written that they have the ability to customize and enter in their information. And then that letter will go directly to their state legislators, the members of the House and the members of the Senate. Um, and that's something that we can help with um, on the national level for, for any of the states that, that are doing something like this or anything else that's PWS related. Um, yeah, so that's an amazing tool. I can't believe that's even an option. Um, national is your friend, obviously. Use them. Dorothea, she, yeah, comes through in a big way. <laughs> Uh, and so uh, so then it goes to the floor where everybody on the floor votes. If it started in the House, it goes to the Senate and you basically do the same thing again on the Senate side. Um, and hopefully it passes that floor. And then um, 
Uh, and then once it has passed the floor, this is what I've been told. I guess you can start reaching out to the governor before this, um, but you want to talk to the governor's office. Um, so you may have passed both floors, but you are like not out of the woods yet. We are not out of the woods yet. Um, now it's time for once it passes the floor, hopefully, um, to uh, reach out to the governor and um, because the governor is going to be in charge of the budget and passing the budget. And so in our case, uh, state Medicaid needs to approve this expanded definition of developmental disability because they're going to be the ones that are funding like the people getting more services. Um, so that's kind of that in a nutshell. And then hey, Chrissy, uh, Chrissy, real quick, can you just just um, caution them on having the mirror or the what other the mirror bill? Um, what, because we weren't I expecting to go there because I thought it would be like uh, two in the weeds. Should we? So I, I think it's I think it's just a cautionary tale that sometimes things go a lot faster than you expect. Well, are, Tammy, are you referring to having the same bill with the same language going through both houses at the same time? Okay. Yes. Yeah, def you definitely Chrissy, absolutely, because this is this is where a lot of people who who have don't have prior experience working in government kind of like lose it a little bit. Um, you want to have a mirror image of the bill that you are that is being introduced in in one part, whether it's the House or the Senate, you want to have that mirror image in the in the other portion of the legislature, and you want them both to be going through their respective committees at the same time. Because once that happens, and once they get passed on the floor, they get passed. If they are still the mirror image of each other, they get passed to the the other chamber and they get voted on. If there is a difference, they go to something called conference committee and then the differences are worked out. But you want, the, in order to have a bill actually pass the legislature, it needs to pass both houses. So it is in your absolute best interest to have the same bill going through each house at the same time. Okay, I see I've been in Arizona, I've been advised different on that. Like there's two ways really? to do it here oh. is that you can do, typically how it works is you start in one and then there's like your crossover week and then it goes through the other, but it still has its like same bill number or you can drop two at the same time. And I've been, you know, it's just kind of one of those, it's just two different ways to do it. And I've been told that sometimes it's faster, sometimes it's not, um, that it's just a different approach. And maybe it's more effective to do the um, like mirror bill in other states or congressionally perhaps I don't know but um uh, so again it could be a state-by-state state issue so I guess that's one of the things that you have to really you have to again I guess know the players and 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 talk to committee staff yeah, and understand what Michelle works Crow. Yeah. And, that, and that's the thing you don't have to know all of this there are people we have a good cause we have a non a nonpartisan great cause people will help you you just have to um ask and then this is just um, this is our crew. Um, when we did the House of Representatives, this was everybody who showed up. And then when we did the Senate, um, this was everybody who showed up. So where we stand now is that we have um, we're waiting for the House of Representatives. We've we passed unanimously in our policy committee. Uh, we're waiting for it to go to rules, which should be no problem. Um, we pa uh, we passed unanimously in the um, Health Senate Committee. We passed with two nays in the Appropriations Committee. It's going to rules. Um, and then we'll see how the floor vote shakes out. So that's where we are now. Um, and I will stop screen sharing. And real quick, this, this happened, um, you know, we our first meeting was the January 17th was the House and Human Services Committee. Um, and then two weeks later, we were in the Senate HHS. And then a week later, we were in appropriations. So that's how fast everything rolled once yeah. they got rolled. Yeah, yeah it moves pretty quick. Um, and then if it's not moving quick, you may uh, you may want to kind of check on it, um, kind of call some of your contacts that you've made along the way to just say like, hey, I realize it hasn't been, you know, uh, on the agenda for rules yet. Should I be worried? Which I actually just did. And I was assured that everything is fine. <laughs> <laughs>
you guys, you guys are rocking and rolling. Like what you're doing is amazing. And, and I don't know if, if you mentioned it before, but um, we've talked about the Arizona session ending in June, correct? So that's, is that, that's correct. Am I right guys? Okay. Uh, well, because so it's, it usually goes till June cause they're doing like budget stuff, but I, it's, I think it's supposed to end like in May. I, they usually like go way longer though. Okay. Um, it's supposed to be a hundred days and it started in January. So, okay. Um, but I feel like they battle over the budget, like until the bitter end every well, year. I don't know if Arizona is like Florida, but if they are, that's really the only, the only bill that's required by, um, th that's required by like constitution is that we have to pass the budget every single year. They don't have to pass anything else. So if they don't pass the budget, they go into special session, which is so much fun because that costs the taxpayers lots of extra money to keep them back in session. Uh, so. There's so much to learn. And honestly, you know, I have to admit that when I first started figuring it out, I was like, I get this. <laughs> and then I got a little deeper and I was just like, oh man, I do not. <laughs> I am like, you, I am you, okay. could, you could always go back and watch the old videos from Schoolhouse Rock from back in the day. If you're that old, if you're Stop not, it, you'll Tammy. do it. <laughs> Relevant though. Um, and it's just great. I, and I have to say that, you know, I'm hoping that this passes, but it has been such an amazing experience. It's been so incredibly empowering. I feel like it's just been such a bonding experience for our Arizona families. Um, and I've just made so many wonderful connections. I spoke to Ron Barber on the phone for like an hour the other day, and he's very impressed. <laughs> <laughs> he's, a, he's a previous senator of ours. <laughs> yeah, I, so there's just like these, uh, it's just, it's pretty wild, you know, just, um, it's, it's very rewarding, um, as you kind of start moving through it and start, um, trying to, to, to have the system work. It's, it's fascinating, really. So we're going to, we're going to support Chrissy when she try. runs for office. <laughs> I call her she's small but mighty. She's right. small but mighty. Let, don't let her uh, her teeny stature fool you for one second. I want to get her. I want to get her to move to New Hampshire. <laughs> right. I think. I think you're going to have to fight over that. I think there's going to be a few states that are be like, no, come on, come on over here. <laughs> but you guys, seriously, what you're doing is amazing, and and I'm really appreciative and I know that that everybody who's been able to join us tonight and everybody that's going to be watching this is really appreciative of the, of the work that you're doing and and thank you for putting so much so much effort into putting together that presentation because it's 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 so important for people to to understand that anybody can be involved in this process and that that's what the process is made for and that you don't have to be an expert um to 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 be passionate and to have your voice heard and what you guys are doing and continue to do is just so impressive and so amazing and I'm so grateful to have you as a part of our community giving giving us a, a bigger voice it, it makes I, me really really happy I want to say one more thing is that um the fact that we're not experts is like that is a that is a good thing. You know, this is this is a treat for them to have real passionate families come forward with a problem that they see. Um, I, it, it's our superpower. It's not a, it, it's, you know, the privilege is theirs as far as I'm concerned. I love that. And the people we spoke to said that exact, exact same thing was they're used to hearing lobbyists every day. And when they're actually hearing, you know, rather than a lobbyist who's getting paid to do this, you know, it makes such a huge impact, you know, on, on, uh, on them, right? On them. Right. So, guys, Christy, can can, can Christy I Rockton. can I open it up? If anybody else, I'm just since since they're done sharing their PowerPoint, if there's anyone who wants to come off mute and ask any questions or make any comments, um, I invite you to go ahead and do so now. I just, I want to be cognizant on time. I know it's late for some of you. So, but please feel free to, to jump in and ask some questions. I would like to say something too. One thing that I think makes us a very successful team is the communication. We are open. It's just like with any relationship, you want it to be strong with clear communication. And that's what makes us such a solid team. So I'm very proud of the girls and all of us in Arizona and national. 
<laughs> you guys are amazing. Are there are is there anyone else who has any questions? I know, you know, we lost we lost Sue Cologne who was on here for quite some time. I know she has a little one with with PWS. Um, and she's she's also new to to our advocacy work. Um, and you know, she was also inspired by what you all are doing in Arizona um, and what we're doing on a national level. And she reached out to um, her, her uh, local government and received actually a proclamation today from the mayor of her city um, in Jersey, recognizing PWS and advocacy efforts. And it was really beautiful. So I'm sorry we lost her, but I know when you have a little one, it's, it gets, it gets a little tough and she's got two little. So um but it's what what you all are doing is inspiring our entire community, and I'm just I want to thank you, and I'm so grateful that we have you as a part of our community, giving giving all of us a voice. So it's really exciting. Dorothea, send them the video because you guys can search our bills and videos attached, so you can see you can listen to what we said, um, and both the House and the Senate. We okay. can maybe I, out if we, I'd like I'd like the official videos um so that we could actually see faces because <laughs> i have the unofficial videos oh I'll, i can send them to you that would yeah, that would be great and the slides also thank you so much for for allowing us to kind of make that available um and is it is it okay if we make that available for people who even weren't able to make it tonight is that okay yeah absolutely okay that's wonderful thank you guys so much um, all right. So if anybody, if no one else has any questions or any comments, I'm just going to go ahead and, and close it up for today. And thank you all. Thank you, Arizona. You guys are amazing and such an inspiration to our community. So grateful to have you. So thank you so much.